What's your carnal theory? Hey there, you're listening to Carnal Theory, where we talk with experts from around the world to learn how taking command of our sexual story affects our personal wellness, sexual experiences, and relationships with ourselves and others. Hi, everyone. I'm Abba. And I'm Amanda, and today we're talking with Elena Tochev, a movement coach whose teachings are inspired by nature and deeply rooted in self-awareness. Her goal is to empower people with more autonomy over movement and the ability to move well in day-to-day activities. She's also an instructor with us at the MySex Bio Studio, where she teaches a movement and an intention class, um, actually two of them, form and energy, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about that later. But hi, Elena, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited. Yeah, hi, Eva. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to get to have someone on one time with you on the show. Um, as you know, uh, and as a reminder for our listeners, we like to start each of our Kernel Theory episodes with a Kernel Theory for us all to consider. And um, it, the theory, it's meant to challenge a presumption or a perception that we might have about something. And as a reminder, we'll end the episode as well by revisiting this theory just to see if maybe, maybe our mindset has changed on what's been brought to the table. So if you would like to kick us off, what's the carnal theory that you've brought for our consideration today? Yeah, so today's carnal theory, the carnal theory that I'd like to bring and share with you is a quote from Braiding Sweetgrass, author Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's the land is the, te- the real teacher. All we need as students is mindfulness. The land is the real teacher. All we need as students is real mindfulness. That's beautiful. Yes. And for those who haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, it's a beautiful read and I very much recommend it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. I find myself just, you know, underlining so many moments through that book of just um, opportunities where I could take her words, reflect and connect with my own place and space. And it was a really great book to yeah, connect with myself. And as you mentioned, Amanda, that's a really big part of, of my teachings and my sharings is the self-awareness piece um, that I think informs not only the movement, but how I interact and express myself out into the world as well. So, um, yeah, happy to share that with us today. Thank you. Yes. And, and so in today's episode, also, you're going to be sharing a, a ritual for the summer solstice with us as a tease for our listeners. Um, and uh, we were talking earlier, and, and this, this theory definitely underlines it. Um, but how do you see the connection of nature and mindfulness, how, how that connects to movement? Yeah, good question. Um, it's something that um, I've thought about a lot in past uh, because both movement and nature have been a big part of my life. Um, so maybe a little bit of a personal story of how that um, ins- those two pieces have inspired m- me in the work that I'm doing. Um, Movement has just always been something that I've always had a part of my life, being very active, coming from an active family, but that's from a very like uh, physical perspective, I would say, like sports and, and definitely being outside in nature and moving around. Um, but I was a very um, dedicated yoga student, practicing Ashtanga yoga for probably like six to eight years, very consistently, six days a week on my mat, 5.30, getting up to be on my mat at 6 a.m. So I would say pretty dedicated and really um, just kind of drop myself fully into this practice and this space and being there and feeling really connected to the community that I was a part of. Um, But doing that practice so um so consistently in such a very similar pattern of movement every single day into forms and shapes that I think I look back at now and I think oh my gosh how did I get my body into those positions um really didn't I really wasn't thinking about the movement necessarily as much as I was just getting myself into these poses and um whether or not it was a result whether or not that 
forced some um, injuries. I'm not sure, but I definitely feel that there is some association there. So I, I had some really bad issues with my back after this practicing, doing some pretty intense dropbacks. Um, and that just made me question what I was doing. And so I had to take a break from it all and just take a step back and really think about the practice and whether or not it was really serving me. Um, and kind of along the same, at the same time, uh, when that happened, I also, um, was kind of just dropped into a space and time in my life where my health was, uh, really compromised. I developed breast cancer at a young age of 36 and had to go through some really intense treatment. So much of my life was really just abruptly stopped and put on hold. So then my focus shifted entirely to this medical treatment that I was going through. And during that time of my life, there was a lot of moments where I was questioning many things and spending time in nature was just the place that brought me the most peace and I was really just able to connect with myself rather than all of the appointments and the medications and the surgeries and everything else that was going on in my life. Um, nature and being outside on my own in solitude there was just really, really wonderful. So that to me was a big part of my healing through that journey and after. So yeah, in those moments connecting with nature, I kind of just, was able to pull myself outside of all of the thoughts and just really focus in on what really mattered and small like little beautiful things like watching an ant crawl up a blade of grass was just like amazing to me and a really special moment and something that I really appreciated and probably didn't notice often enough. So um, yeah, that was kind of a pivotal moment and really influential in terms of my practice, my own personal practice, but how I wanted to do my work in this world was um, just being a, a form of support for other people to step into that personal practice of their own. Um, a really important lesson that I learned through that experience is that we're all individuals, right? We all come from different places, different experiences. We have different needs and desires. And so I don't think that there's one practice that fits for everybody. And I think it's better to allow uh, people to explore that on their own. And I think nature is a really wonderful way to do that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So when you are combining, you know, intention, nature, and movement. What does that look like in like a literal sense? How does your movement connect to nature? Yeah, so um, during that time where my yoga practice kind of was put on hold treatment and then getting back into a physical practice of some sort, I was just naturally wanting to be outside, being in nature and doing practice outside. So. I got back into practicing yoga, but I was doing it outside in nature, in parks, um, in my backyard, in the sun. Um, and I think that that supported me getting back into a physical state that I was really comfortable with. But then I started to explore like how my body was moving through just natural explorations that I was doing on my own. So I love hiking through forest trails and I love getting down and observing like the flowers that are just popping up or blossoming, right? So there right in itself is like this really deep squat position where you're really down low to the ground. And for me, I like to spend some good time just exploring and observing. So it's putting my body in, in natural positions, I think, that I didn't necessarily think were important to uh, build as, a, as a, a practice or as a skill, build that skill and, and understanding how the joints and the muscles all are working to support holding a movement like a deep squat for five, 10 minutes, maybe as you're like harvesting some wild leeks or something like this, right? Um, so that was a really great segue to understand like how movement speaks to me in, in, out in nature. And then just wanting to explore, you know, like walking across a log, can I do, can I do that? <laughs> you know, and when I first started doing it, it was just like, 
you feel like a child again. Like this is so much fun and creating little, um, uh, I don't know, just like connecting games connect out of it. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. Um, uh, like little courses, right? Obstacle courses of getting your way through a space. And it's just a different way to connect with the outside. And um, rather than segmenting them into different parts, like today I'm gonna go to the gym for an hour and then I'm gonna go, uh, go for a walk or then I'm going to make, you know, somehow connect in the garden. We can do all of those things together. They kind of all support each other at the same time as well. Um, so just thinking how I do things and how much time I have in a day to do all those things that I really love. Yeah. Mm. The, the way that that potentially can become a ritual, are there elements like I know you do, I know you do a number of things, <laughs> um, you're in natural dying things that in a number of things specifically that intersect of nature and craft and movement and skill. Um, right. Do you see from your from your story and your your background of, of how those maybe intersected into creating rituals? Because my, my understanding is also that new moons, full moons, solstices, that those are pretty sacred for you, which is one of the reasons that we're doing this today. So I'm curious how that journey transitioned from loving these things and finding joy and connection with them to what I might label as like a level up from that in a way or, or next kind of combination of it of creating rituals from this just to tie in what we're getting we're going to get into in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that there was a time after my, my treatment, my breast cancer treatment that I just was on a personal journey to explore myself a little bit deeper. You know, something abrupt in your life comes up and you question things and you're searching for answers. And I think it just naturally supported me moving and connecting with different communities, places, people um, that were practicing these things as well. So um, it's not to say that they weren't present in my life before, but I don't think I focused on them the same way. And I don't think I brought intention to those practices the same way. Um, and therefore, I don't think that they were as consistently part of my life and part of my practice, my own personal practice. So um, yeah, it was just going on a deep exploration of, you know, connecting with, like you said, the different phases of the lunar cycle, the moon, um, understanding how all of these natural rhythms that we see and hear about, uh, whether that's the cycle of the moon or the cycle of the sun, as we'll be talking about a little bit uh, later, the cosmos, how all of these things are expanded out beyond us here on earth, but still influencing us and connecting with us in ways as well as thinking about like our ancestors, the people that came before us that practiced all of these rituals and ceremonies and held space for that and shared knowledge to continue these things down. So um, I, I remember my grandmothers being very connected to the moon and you know, as a child, there'd be certain small rituals that they would do, but I never really paid too close attention to them. And now that those things are more of a part of my personal practice, I'm thanking them. I'm bringing them into this experience with me to be present with me. Because I know that it's just not myself here that is on this planet that's, you know, there's, there's another spiritual element, a soulful element to all of these practices that I like to include as well. Um, so, you know, through movement, I think movement is a wonderful way to connect um, what we're experiencing in our bodies on either a physical or an emotional level. And a lot of the times, some of the more intense personal practices or reflections that we might be doing um, might bring up certain feelings. And how do we process those things? You know, like, if you're in conversation with somebody, perhaps you might see it in their body language, how they're expressing them, themselves. Um, or we might just hold it. We might hold on to these like traumas or experiences, emotions in parts of our body. And that was a big, that was a big thing for me. Like, do I actually pay attention to what my body is telling me, to what is physically showing up, emotionally showing up? 
or am I ignoring it? And I no longer wanted to ignore those things. And having these consistent, regular practices in my life allows me that opportunity to listen. This is the self-awareness piece that I think is really important um, to be able to listen and, and understand yourself better. And movement is a really wonderful way to, to allow those emotions, those feelings to be expressed rather than holding on to them. The movement piece allows them to move through your body. You can still you know, use the expression that's happening or you can let it go, right? But it's, it's first and foremost understanding, well, where is it? Where do I feel it in my body? How is it coming up for me? And then what do I do with it? So having the tools then through, you know, experience or being in communities with people who are there to help assist you, to support you through these experiences as well. Yeah, I have one more question before we get into the, um, asking you a little bit more about the summer solstice ritual specifically, all this ties into it a bit. Um, you mentioned uh, natural rhythms, how that ties into uh, movement and, and your practices. And you just mentioned expression um, and how that moves through you. When I think of solstice, I might be very wrong in this, but I think maybe I, maybe I associate this with kind of a lot of rituals in general. I think of a lot of yin and yang and, and, and the balance of things. And this month in your studio classes, you are focusing on balance while uh, my six bio's larger theme is uh, masculine and feminine en energies and diving into those and how those affect our sexual selves and our our own well-being um and like i just said you've you've adapted that and taken that as a form of balance this yin and yang as i as i would place it um Are there rituals that you do or that you know of that help you keep in balance of that yin and yang? Do you see that as part of what is beneficial of having rituals? Because a lot of it, you, in, in, your, in your theory, you're mentioning mindfulness. To me, mindfulness also evokes balance. And when you are balanced, you're able to have that mindfulness. Um, so I guess the question is, are there are there specific rituals or practices that you do that help center you and balance you of these otherwise rhythms that are going on? Yeah. Okay. Good question. I think personally, speaking personally, I see these natural rhythms as, as cycles, cycles in, in, in time and space and experience. So, um, for me, rather than thinking about it as this shift of like maybe one side to another, um, I'm thinking of it more about where am I in this, in this cycle of, of time. So uh, for example, the, the solstice is a time when the earth is revolving around the sun. And this happens to be the longest day of the year when the sun is kind of still. The, the word solstice is broken down into soul meaning sun, stis being still. So in this time, what are the things that are happening out and around me in nature? Um, so I think of the sun first and foremost, right? It's, it's the longest day. I'm probably outside the most, you know, if it's nice and sunny, especially. Um, there's, more, there's more light, there's more daylight, so there's more activity happening. Um, I'm looking at nature to see what's blossoming in terms of the flowers, in terms of what's popping up out of the earth and what's expressing, how the earth is expressing itself to us. Um, I've been seeing, for example, these wonderful creatures, the snails um, crawling out because right now it's a little bit more rainy in this season of June here in, in Europe. And, you know, connecting with them and seeing this slow pace and this movement just, connecting with things and understanding that we're all moving through this, this cycle. And it's not necessarily about being on one side or another, or how can I bring everything back into some sort of a center, but more so respecting about, respecting where we are in that time and in that phase and knowing that we're all going to come around in some way again. 
you know, things, things will change, things will pass. And I think the mindfulness piece really fits in well there so that you're just, you're, you're aware of where you are in that present moment. And um, I think it takes practice to accept wherever you are, whether it's on a side that you want to be or not, um, but respecting that we all go through those experiences ups and downs, highs and lows, but that we'll all come back. Everything comes back in time. Everything has its own phase, its own part of the cycle. So that's how I like to think of, of my rituals, right? They're, they're a consistent piece of my daily living. Um, and each day is a new day, right? Each turn of the earth around the sun, I get another opportunity to go to this practice and observe in myself how I'm feeling how I'm moving, um, how I want to express myself today, or how I don't. So um, I think showing up and being present and giving myself the time and space to ask those questions of myself keeps me in balance. Thank you. I like that. Mm -hmm. So shifting kind of more towards specifically the summer solstice, which if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, and we've kind of already hinted to this, this is the day that the sun is high in the sky. We have more daylight than any other day in the year. Um, mm -hmm. And this year, that's on June 21st, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so come, it's coming up. Um, so when we're talking about the summer solstice, what are, like, and you're starting to create your ritual around that, um, what are you thinking about when you're creating that ritual, what energies are there? What things do you want to call upon? Yeah, um, maybe from a from a personal from a personal practice experience. Um, definitely, as I mentioned, I'm observing like what's happening out in nature. What are these natural? Where are we in that natural rhythm of the season? Um, so being in the northern hemisphere, yeah, things are beautifully in bloom. So I don't know if you're walking outside, it's hard not to pass like some beautiful fragrance and stop and experience it. Take, take a moment to do that. Um, the color, the lushness of the leaves, um, you know, the earth right now is wet and the smell that comes up from that as you're stepping and walking through um, a forest trail, for example. Um, so I really look to what's happening outside and around me and I think that it speaks to a much bigger picture. So uh, if you think about these, this blossoming and this expansion, it's, it's also a way that we can think about practice and ritual for the solstice is where, where in my life, how do I want to show up to fully express myself and like in this beautiful fullness? Um, so, you know, thinking, I always like to think about um, an intention, you know, bringing something of intention to a practice, a ritual, a ceremony. And I look to nature to inspire that first and foremost. And then through my own personal practices, I've learned that fire is a really big element uh, at this time during the solstice. And if you think about fire, well, from, from my experience, I remember a few years ago in Southern France, they gather particular herbs that are in blossom and bloom full at that time of year. And they bundle them together and they invoke wishes into these bundles or release things that they no longer want to hold onto into these bundles. And they produce this beautiful big bonfire. And then they're throwing these branches from pastures into the, into the flame. So yeah, I like to see how, different cultures experience things a little bit differently and then they're, but they're all still connecting with really similar elements, which I think is really cool. So um, fire is like intention and it, it's kind of, your, your focus is in on something. There's the crackle and the sound and the color is vibrant and it's a feeling like this burning feeling inside of you to, to express and to let out. So um, that's another example of, yeah, how nature and an element can inform practice. So I don't necessarily like to keep my, my ritual so rigid. Um, there's definitely certain elements that I think are reflected based on what I'm seeing, but I also just respect how I'm feeling that day. Like maybe I don't want to do a really big ceremony or ritual on the solstice and that's okay with me too. 
obviously if I'm hosting something, I want to show up well and, and be able to support other people. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're all coming from different places and what we want to experience, I think um, understanding that is really valuable. So not trying to push or inform people of what they should be practicing or how they should be practicing. It could be something as simple as lighting a candle every day. And with that lighting is your intention and being reminded of what your intention was and where are you today with that intention. Can you walk us through the ritual? <laughs> can you set the scene? Um, can you set the scene of how we can, uh, how, how, how you're going to advise us to, to set our scene now and therefore also what others can take to, um, to tap into? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, I think first and foremost, speaking about land and how important nature and land is, I wanted to take an opportunity to acknowledge the land that, that I'm on and I invite the two of you to share if you feel you'd like to as well. Um, considering that we're all coming from different places across the globe today, um, I wanted to just bring in this idea of acknowledging and honoring the people that um, have lived on this land before me and honoring their presence, their, their spirit here with us today um, and acknowledging the work that they did to establish this land that I'm so fortunate to live on right now. So for me coming from Basel, Switzerland, um, I did some, I'm, I'm new to this, to this city. So connecting with uh, the people and the ancestors here from this land is, is something that I'm just getting into myself right now to learn a little bit more. I love researching about history and culture. So I want to just pay some respect and acknowledgement to the Helvetii, a, um, a Celtic people of Switzerland, um, and honor their presence here um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years before me. And um, yeah, I invite the two of you. Is this something that you've ever practiced before, acknowledging land? Do you yeah, have yeah. Time? For me, I um, well, I so I'm in the White Mountains of northeastern America, um, which is mostly Abenaki land. Specifically, where I live is the Pakakwit tribe, uh, or, or was once the Pakakwit tribe's land. Um, and yeah, I the work I do up in the White Mountains, we um, start most of our meals with a land acknowledgement and, you know, um, an acknowledgement that we are recreating here due to many colonial practices that are, um, that, that have brought us here. Um, so I really enjoy uh, starting meals and things like that. It's like a moment of gratitude um, and acknowledgement. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I cannot say that I have. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, what hits me hard as soon as you started saying that, what immediately got my eyes welled up is just the the um, the climate that our that the country, the United States, is in right now, and that. Uh, as as I'm seeing it from here, the rest of the world seems to be feeling the ripple effects of. And I, I just a very overwhelming just sense of like fuck. Um, God damn it, we need to do that. <laughs> um, not not just for in, in my mind right now uh not just for um the native americans and giving them space and recognition not just for that but in terms of like holding what i what holding space for our history in general and the the layers of time of of use and occupation and cultivation that uh, that the lands that we are on now have had and I just am yeah I'm just I'm struck that that disassociation very specifically uh, pr very probably <laughs> 
has has a, a a direct relationship to why we just don't give a flying fuck about anything right now and, and in general today in the masses um both in terms of people as well in terms of literally the land and the climate change degradation that we are pushing onto our our, our local lands and and globally um mm. yeah we should really hug some fucking trees hug one another <laughs> yes yes I would like to invite us, if you all have your candles with you, is to actually light our candle. Here's where we can bring the presence of our ancestors, of these people that came before us in acknowledgement as we light a candle. This can be our first reflection of opening up this ritual and practice. And I welcome you to place the candle either close to you right now or close to your, your space where we'll be moving shortly. Keeping the candle lit. And as we move forward, I'd like to also introduce a really important plant. This is juniper um, and I'm gonna use it today in ceremony because juniper is a really important plant that helps to not only clear a space, but fill it with blessing. And it's a really wonderful plant to use at the beginning of experiences like ceremonies and rituals to invoke a sense of kinship. So I think it also pairs really wonderfully with what we're just sharing with the land acknowledgement in addition, this practice of smudging is an ancient practice used by indigenous peoples of the Americas, not only in ceremony, but other rites and practices. And I want to acknowledge the fact that this, this experience right here, right now is also something that's been passed down. So as respect, appreciating, acknowledging that this practice has come before us and that we can continue sharing it on this earth together. So I invite you to burn your own bundle if you have. And at this time, we can just think about how we're here together tonight, sharing in this practice and in this space, and we're connecting with our ancestors, not only through land, but through ceremony, through tradition. And just allowing the smoke to, if you have it with you, Just allowing it to bring a certain feeling. Allowing your sense of smell. If you don't have the smoke with you, just imagine what that would smell like. Juniper is an evergreen. So it's got this beautiful woodsy scent to it. And finally, as a last piece, if there's anything else that you'd like to bring to your own space tonight before we move into ritual, as I shared, I have the small snail shell, but if there's any plant or any piece of nature that you have that's close by and you'd like to bring into your own space tonight before we move into our practice of movement, I welcome you to do so. Okay, so ladies, I'd like to bring us now into the movement piece. I'm gonna pause and we're gonna edit this. Okay, ladies, so before we move towards our mat for our movement, I'd like us to set a small intention together. 
So if you'd like to bring your hands together and start to rub your hands against each other. And we're gonna do this for a minute or so. So you really wanna to start to create this energy, feel this warmth, thinking about the fire that we just mentioned and that element and what that element invokes to this practice. And as we rub our hands, I want to bring a little bit of an intention into our practice today. And that is thinking about ways that you can nourish your own cycle of growth and transformation and how we can use the summer solstice, nature, land to inform that, to aid us in that. Next, we're going to take our hands, placing one on top of each other and over our heart space. You're welcome to close your eyes if you'd like to. And just take a moment to make a sacred summer wish for yourself. Slowly opening your eyes when you're ready. And gently with intention, moving yourself towards your mat. So I've asked you all to bring a pillow, or bolster, something to your mat, to your floor, to the earth, to the ground, wherever you are today. And we're going to lay with our backs along the bolster along the pillow and I want you to place the base of the pillow just kind of where your low back meets your pelvis so you want to first have your bum have your seat on the floor and then we'll slowly lean back onto the support and you may want to have an extra pillow for your head perhaps So this idea of how can the natural rhythms support us, aid us in nourishing our own lives and nourishing the wish that you set up as an intention for your summer solstice, for the summer ahead of us. Taking your hands and placing them on your low belly. And taking a few expansive breaths into this space. In this space, we hold a lot of our understanding. In this space, we have a lot of our, our true knowing of ourselves, our, our gut instinct, you could say. So we're going to move through this space today to help support us moving through that intention to better understand what it is that we need, what it is that we want, our desires to support us through the season ahead. So with your legs bent and feet placed on the floor, about hip width apart, I want you to first just slowly and gently rock your hips from side to side, just noticing how they feel slightly lower compared to the torso and the rest of the upper body. There's a little bit of gravity that's allowing our pelvis to suspend here towards the floor. We're going to move through a series of hip raises. And I want you to take these really nice and slow and try to think about how you can move slowly through your spine. So first thinking about your tailbone, which is the base of your spine. And you think about slowly starting to tuck your tailbone between the legs and maybe gently push down through both of your feet and really slowly lifting the hips up off the floor 
Maybe continuing to round and flex through your low back and spine, allowing the low back and spine to peel up away from your pillow or support until you reach maybe your low ribs and then pause there for a moment. Pushing down through your feet, thinking about the soles of your feet and heels pulling back towards your bum. And then slowly allowing your spine to make contact again with the support. And you're slowly allowing the spine to express down towards the tailbone. And then eventually feeling like the pelvis and the hips continue beyond the support moving towards the floor. I'm just noticing how this feels for the pelvis. There's a natural movement and expansion and stretch through the pelvic wall, through the low belly, through the hips. And then I would invite you to move your feet into a different position. So perhaps you want to heel toe your feet a little bit wider than hip width apart. And we're going to slowly move into that spinal roll once again. So drawing the tailbone under, thinking about tucking it between the legs as you push through your feet. Engaging through the glute muscles to help round the spine up and extend through the front of the hips. And maybe your spine continues to round until you reach your low rib. And then taking a moment to pause here, just noticing how this position feels for the hips or the pelvis, or the lower part of your body. Maybe taking a slow exhale as you lower, rounding, lowering the spine towards the support, inch by inch. Noticing how this different placement of your legs now is translating through the expression of your pelvis, your pelvic wall, as it sinks slowly down towards the floor. Maybe just taking a nice slow breath here, pausing for a moment. And let's try moving the feet in one last position different from the first two. So perhaps you want to heel toe your feet together so that the toe, the soles of your feet are touching one another. And maybe you'd like to have your legs open to the side. Thinking about pushing into the outer edges of your feet, now tucking the tailbone under and slowly rounding, flexing through your spine. Inch by inch, it peels away from the support. You're engaging the glutes to support the hips rising and extending. Pausing for a moment and maybe taking a breath here and understanding how this position is feeling. For the body, for the pelvis, for the lower part of your body. And then slowly lowering the spine inch by inch back down towards the support. Allowing the pelvis and hips to sink one last time towards the floor. And in this final position with the feet, giving yourself a moment to understand and experience how this feels. Maybe a slightly different stretch through the pelvic wall. Maybe you want to do some shifting here through the hips. 
Does the body want to express itself in any way? Taking a nice slow breath in through the nose and out through the nose. If your legs are still apart, you can slowly draw them together. Heel toe the feet so that they're back to hip width apart. Placing the hands back on the low belly. And taking a moment with your inhalation to think about moving the breath down towards your hands. And with the inhalation, can the breath move and expand in towards your hands. Moving the hands towards the sides of your body. Allowing that expansion and expression with breath to move into the hands at the sides of your body. And perhaps thinking about the back side of your body that's in contact with the support. And can you think about expanding the breath here at the low back with your inhalation, it gently expands into the support. And with your exhalation, it softens back. Thinking of your breath as this beautiful, full 360 degrees of expansion. Bringing yourself back to that intention, how we can use natural rhythms, in life, in nature, to support, to support us in our expression and of our summer wish. And then slowly in your own time, you can gently make your way over onto one side of your body and pushing yourself up into a comfortable seated position. And then once again, we can take our hands and place them on our hearts. Breathing into the low belly. And thinking about how our breath is moving through our body, traveling up to the heart, expanding into our hands and then cycling back from the hand through the heart, through the body and out the nose. I want to thank you both for sharing this practice with me today, for taking the time to acknowledge where you are in your day, in your place, in time. And just allowing yourself to continue naturally expressing your intention, yourself, your full love, your fullness today and for the days ahead. Thank you. You can slowly place the hands down into your lap and gently open your eyes if you'd like to. And I'm gonna leave the candle still burning for us. And perhaps now we can move back together to our place and maybe connect about how we felt in that practice and if there's anything you'd like to share, any feelings that came up, maybe what it meant for you. I, I, I definitely feel more balanced. <laughs> I'm wondering 
if um, if hips and back and pelvis that that has a specific um, solstice relationship or if that or connection to it or if that's what in in your practice and ritual you thought to hone in on I'm just curious. yeah I think definitely from a female perspective um, just that space connecting to that space I think is a wonderful way to just understand who you are um, connecting with our own our own rhythm our own cycle whether that's our menstrual cycle or just where you are I think going into that deep place in the pelvic area there's a lot of inner knowing so yeah I think connecting it to this soul solstice practice today was important because I think this is a beautiful opportunity to fully express ourselves, whether it's a, an intention that we have for ourselves or just understanding where we are at this time of year and moving through that space, I think supports that definitely. Amanda, do you want to, do you want to give any reflections on the, yeah. on the ritual? And I, I can bring that in. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I haven't used my smudge stick since I bought it, which was like a year or so ago. Um, and so it just, the smell of it brought me back to this like moment of cleansing when I used it when I first moved into my house. Mm -hmm. um, so the, that that even in, a, in and of itself was very, it felt like reminiscent and brought me back to a really pleasant moment. Um, but mm -hmm. I think that connecting to like these micro movements in my hips has this ability to just tune me in more to where I am and how I'm feeling and I definitely harbor a lot of um, tightness in that area of my body so it felt really good to just slowly move and it, feel, it felt so good. It didn't hurt at all, which was really nice. So it felt really refreshing. Amazing. I think that the gravity there, just allowing ourselves to be well supported by the pillow or whatever was underneath your back, and then having the hips lay off of the pillow and that sense of like weightedness, but still feeling really supported and safe is also a really nice piece um to, to those hip raises um yeah and just feeling more expression expansion moving through like as you allow it to really over express itself um there's a, i think different movements and micro micro expressions like you're mentioning amanda for sure that came through for me too so um, and i'm really glad you both enjoyed it i encourage us all to move more like when in doubt get up and move get outside even if it's like on your balcony and just look out at a tree smell a little flower clipping that you might have at your desk or blossom or something like this you know look closely because nature is not far away from us you know getting out and doing a beautiful one hour two hour hike in the forest is amazing but if we can't get there if things aren't as accessible you know time wise space wise there's still things around us that can bring us into those moments and have those reflections and using our senses to experiencing experience those things I think is um, a really beautiful practice and small little things that we can just bring into our day. And I want to call out too. I think I think your classes are very much these tastes of rituals, uh, the form class and the energy class. Uh, I think you frame them in a way that gives them um gives them a like we focus on usually a, a certain part of our bodies and we give love and attention to that and that's that's a ritual practice yeah um, absolutely. when you're crafting those classes um do you have are, are you do you do you are you thinking of that as you're making them uh like starting here and building up and ending seeing where we can end 
Yeah, I think with these classes, I'm definitely focusing in on something specific, given that they're, um, it's, it's a half an hour of, of time that we also include some connection and communication with our fellow, um, our fellow students in that we, I, I think of form in a way to really give us some foundational elements to understand how our body moves, to understand how all of these small micro movements that we we're talking about are all connected and how we can hone in on something really particularly, really focused and understand it better. But then how does it also expand out into more global movements across the body? Because our body is so smart, like it, it all wants to move together and it all wants to help out. But how, I think understanding and how things move on their own, particularly joints and the muscles that are supporting specific joints within our body, when we practice those things on their own in isolation, they, then we, we have this understanding. Our body has this understanding in a way that it wants to express so that when we move to a bigger movement, a more expansive movement, they're all, they're all in. They're ready to work and move with you. So that's the intention behind form. Um, the intention behind energy, uh, same idea. It's a really focused class in terms of timing, but how can we bring energy into our day, into our space? And there's really creative ways, I think, that we can pull ourselves out of moments of being tired or slumped or just exhausted sometimes even, right? And small practices that don't necessarily require us to get out and do this like really, really vigorous run or big movements. Like you can even just stand in a static position, but when you're isolating particular parts of your body altogether, things just fire up. Hips are one of those, those areas, actually. I really love expression through hips. Um, it can be really grounding like we did in today's practice, but it can also be really invigorating all in how you're using it. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up today's episode, we want to just return back to the carnal theory that you brought to us. Uh, mm -hmm. The land is the real teacher. All we need as students is mindfulness. I think that's just a beautiful circle and everything that we've talked about. Thank you so much for bringing that to the conversation. Really, really. Um, I, I, as I mentioned at the top, part of it is to see if our perceptions or thoughts might have changed on it. I, without hesitation, feel deeper connected to that, to that theory. Um, and I actually think I'm probably going to add it somewhere where I can, can see that a little more often. It's, um, yeah. I love it in, in the thought too of like when maybe maybe the solstice but when you're creating these rituals for yourself whatever they look like to you know tune into be be mindful tune into what you're seeing around you and let it tell you what is in cycle like what is what cycle the earth is in and you are in and what energies are so vibrant right now yeah so i like that in terms of like you know movement and and maybe like just your day-to-day -day mindfulness but also in terms of looking to that to create rituals absolutely yeah mm -hmm. so if you uh have any questions or insights and you want to reach out to us you can do that at carnal theory on instagram or at my sex bio on instagram you can also reach out to elena at elena tochev on instagram um, and if you are interested in attending any of elena's classes um, as we mentioned they're named form and energy you can find those and register at mysexbiostudio.org thank you Wonderful. Thanks, ladies. It was a pleasure to be here and share with you all. Thank you so much, Elena. Carnal Theory is produced by My Sex Bio. Our sound design is by Audrey Cohane, and our theme music by Men the Universe. My Sex Bio is an educational platform built to empower people like you to take command of your sexual biography. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, and Spotify at My Sex Bio. 
Visit our website and join our e-letter at mysexbio.org and support our work by joining our Patreon. Thank you.